Repeatedly, we are told that thousands of years ago, the average person was much fitter than we are. The reason we're all so out of shape today is that we spend so much time sitting, so much time looking at screens, so much time stressed. It's because we eat all the wrong things and never get any sunlight. We are increasingly spending all of our time indoors, alone, hardly moving. I mean, it doesn't sound great when you put it like that. With all that in mind, we might be tempted to say that it's society's fault that we're out of shape, or at least that modern life doesn't exactly help to keep us fit and healthy. That's what I want to examine in this video. Is this true? How responsible are we for our own fitness? What could we do to build a fitter humanity? First, to be clear, I certainly don't believe that there's some big conspiracy at play here. There are accusations floating around the internet that our governments want to keep us weak and docile. Even if the government were adding synthetic hormones to the water supply, which they are not, the resulting drop in testosterone would be tiny and have absolutely zero effect on your voting behaviours. Some people have gotten very rich talking freely online about how little free speech they have. The us vs them narrative is a marketing ploy to sell overpriced, predatory dropshipping courses and make already very rich salespeople richer. A matrix within the matrix, if you will. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that there is no matrix, there's no conspiracy here. There's just a collection of cultural habit and then there's the hedonistic treadmill. I should also make clear at this point that I am not talking about health as much as fitness. Modern nutrition certainly has its problems. There are definitely issues with healthcare. We breathe in a lot of pollution, but that is beyond the scope of this video. Today we're looking at fitness. So what is a very real problem is our sitting, our long stretches of stressed indoor sitting, punctuated by short walks to the train, bus or car, followed by more sitting. This contributes to weight gain, yes, but more concerning and even more pernicious, I believe, is the loss of mobility. I've personally suffered back pain from sitting. It's one of the reasons I went all in on functional training. I saw the damage that this lifestyle was doing to me. I was someone who wanted to perform like a superhero, and yet I couldn't squat at the time due to knee pain and poor ankle mobility. I was constantly putting my lower back out. My friends considered me extremely fit. This is nuts. The lack of cardio that comes from sitting for long stretches is also a problem, leading to a weaker heart and higher risk of all-cause mortality. Most of us are also stressed out for this entire period at work, and our breathing is likely shallow too, owing to our poor posture. And let's be clear, one hour at the gym a few times a week is not enough to make up for sitting the entire rest of the time. And most gym routines do very little to address these most pressing issues anyway. Most people will either train to lose weight with large amounts of cardio, which at least has the added benefit of improving aerobic fitness, or they'll train their mirror muscles, the pecs, abs and shoulders, with the aim of improving aesthetics. Those, by the way, are the muscles that are already tightest and shortest from all the sitting. Skipping leg day might be a meme, but it's also very much the norm. We're piling dysfunction on top of dysfunction. I could point to our insidious obsession with aesthetics as very much encouraging this. Instagram figures pumped with steroids or cosmetic enhancements projecting images of immaculate health that we can't possibly measure up to. And I'm not blaming Instagram or TikTok here. Before that, there were magazine covers. I was self-employed, so I had the best case scenario. But still, the sheer volume of writing I had to complete meant that anything other than sitting for large parts of my day was out of the question. Many people literally aren't allowed to get up other than for toilet breaks. And now I'm aware of how much damage this is doing, I can literally feel myself seizing up as I sit for an extended period. It feels itchy. And this is so much worse for certain cross sections of society too. When my wife and I first moved to London, we lived in a flat so small there was literally nowhere to do push-ups. This is still the reality for many people. But now imagine if those are your living conditions and you also have kids. Maybe you're a single parent. Maybe you work long hours and have to pay for a nanny. You don't have access to a gym, you're exhausted most of the time, and the only food you have the time and money to provide your kids with is microwaved lasagna. You feel like a terrible parent because your kids deserve more, but what are you going to do when you get home at 6pm and when a pack of mints is stretching the budget? And now you're expected to get to the gym as well, or at least do some kind of home workout. Who's going to fill out those school forms, wash up, prep the kids for tomorrow? Chances are you're going to be woken up during the night anyways. It's so easy to point the finger at someone who is out of shape, to tell them that they only have themselves to blame for their poor health, 
that it's their responsibility. Everyone should have a six pack, proclaims some influencers. Everyone should drive a sports car. Your health should always be your number one priority. It's such a naive and unhelpful stance. When you're struggling to make ends meet, when there isn't enough time in the day, your health isn't the number one priority. Sure, you might like it to be, but looking after your family is, putting food on the table, dressing your kids, paying rent, and getting by day to day. So much of modern fitness assumes a certain level of privilege, usually youth as well, and free time. And that's simply not the reality for the vast majority of people. YouTube creators do not provide a reflective sample of the population. So that's all a bit depressing, maybe. But there are, as ever, rays of hope. Modern life isn't all bad. For all we aren't in great shape, we are living longer. There are now cures for more diseases, and we have access to so much information. Those who wish to can educate themselves on matters pertaining to their fitness in ways that we never could have before. The internet might be shortening our attention spans, but it's teaching us to quickly absorb huge amounts of information, and it's giving us tools to create amazing things. While social media is demoralizing for some, it's motivating for others, and what some people are capable of in terms of top-tier performance is absolutely incredible. Driving, even, is an incredible form of brain training, teaching us to be more focused and alert. So there are rays of hope, but what we need now is for society to move more in the right direction. And I'd argue to stop chasing financial growth and to start putting the health and happiness of the population first. What might that look like? Firstly, we need to prioritise healthy varied movement. This starts at work. Many of us are trapped in our offices for the majority of the day, and so our employers have a duty of care. Right now, they're neglecting that duty. Breaks from the desk should therefore be mandated. That might look like a 20 minute break every two hours and a longer lunch break, maybe a two hour break. You can't force people to exercise during this time, but they would have that option. And if workplaces could provide those facilities, even better. This is even more crucial at schools. Schools should seek to maintain and encourage the energy, mobility and love of play that's inherent in children, not stamp it out. We should also, likewise, strongly consider four-day working weeks. Would this negatively impact the bottom line of some of those businesses? I mean, maybe, but... You give people more time and freedom, and they'll be able to fill that time with more nourishing pursuits. And there should be options here. Governing bodies should support and encourage the formation of physical clubs and activities. Free childcare and a universal living wage would further help to take this pressure off. Now, I'm not an economist, so I can't tell you how feasible that is, but I suspect it might be a little bit more feasible than many of us presume. Funny how work or die doesn't result in the best physical or mental health. It's funny because a lot of people are so keen on having the freedom to, you know, someday buy a yacht that they're willing to live most of their lives paycheck to paycheck. Forgetting that the people who buy the yacht are like the 0.1%. As a culture, we need to start celebrating and normalizing movement. We need to encourage more play. We need to lighten up. This starts with what we wear, even. Most of us wear trousers, or pants to you Americans, that are so tight we couldn't squat even if we were able to. Our shoes are literally crippling, squishing our toes together, shortening our calves, deadening our sense of connection to the ground. Which is why I wear barefoot shoes. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Vivo Barefoot. They make, in my opinion, some of the very best barefoot shoes around. These are shoes with a wide toe box, with a very thin sole so you can feel the ground underneath you, and no heel to toe drop so that you're not being forced into this unnatural position. Not only are they better for you on the day to day, but they give you that freedom to run and jump and climb while still looking smart enough to wear into a workplace. You can get 15% off a pair by following the link in the description and using the code BIONEER15. So actually today I've come to London, I'm getting my feet 3D scanned for a really cool project they've got called Vivo Biome. So basically this is going to scan my feet, tell me a little bit about them, and then I should get shoes delivered to me that will be perfectly tailor-made for me. So they're going to be like fitting like a glove. And hopefully that'll make a big difference to how they feel and how I move in them. And yeah, miles away from stuffing yourself into rigid, uncomfortable, stuffy shoes with a big heel and a narrow toe box. I'll let you know how I get on with these once I've got the shoes, but you guys can get involved in this as well if you follow the link in the description down below. You do lunges in a coffee shop and everyone looks at you like you've gone insane. Guys, I'm just moving. Remember moving? Nobody likes it when I run to the shops. And I'm not trying to be all superior here, like, oh, I'm the guy who moves around and these people are just stuck in their boring work lives. That's normal. I recognise that I'm weird and not everyone has to run, but I feel like we need to normalise this. 
ever since I've been moving more regularly throughout the day, training in smaller batches throughout the day, I've had so much more energy and I felt so much less stiff. I'm a parent who barely gets any sleep, who's quite overworked, and I genuinely have more energy and vibrancy than I did five years ago. In an ideal future, I'd love to see architecture, city planning and interior design take this into account. Instead of trying to funnel as many people into shops as possible and facilitate commerce, cities should be designed to naturally encourage movement. I'm talking more calisthenics parks, playgrounds, green spaces and more. People tell you off when you balance along their garden wall, so what if there were balance beams along the side of the road? What if all benches also had dip bars or pull-up bars? What if all stairs also had the option to traverse the wall next to them instead? Again, you can't and shouldn't force people to train, and we need to be mindful of emergencies, disabilities and others. And of course, these things would need to be safe. So these movement options should always be just that, options. But if they are fun and interesting, they should be inherently motivating, encouraging play and experimentation for its own sake. Interior designers should stop viewing empty spaces as dead spaces, as wasted opportunities. Rather, empty space to move around and crawl and play should take center stage. This would just inherently make us so much fitter. Movement shouldn't be something we do occasionally in the gym. Regular, varied movement should be the norm, the default. It gets the blood flowing, keeps the metabolism active, spikes protein synthesis, reinforces neural pathways, boosts energy. And if all this sounds a bit crazy, remember that this is what our planet looks like naturally. This is the default. Before there were cities and streets that funneled us down crowded, narrow paths. There were trees to climb, rocks to jump on, sand to tumble in, rivers to swim in, big open meadows to run in. I've talked at length about the ways in which natural landscapes forge stronger and more resilient bodies. How doing a pull up from a tree branch with its varied heights, angles, vectors and more will always be superior to practicing the same linear movement on a bar over and over. So perhaps even better than a pull up bar by a bench is just a tree by a bench that has like an invitation to climb it. It's not like nature doesn't exist anymore. This is still the case across huge swaths of land, but it's segregated and cut off. Here in the UK, a huge majority of green land is privately owned with restricted access. Private landowners and organisations that have inherited these massive plots of land now jealously guard them and prevent public access. Governments won't do anything to challenge this because they need the funding from those wealthy players and because they are those wealthy players. According to the book Who Owns England, over half the country is owned by less than 1% of the population. What possible justification is there for a single individual or family owning acres of land that they can't possibly make use of. The Right to Roam movement exists to challenge these ideas. Personally, I believe this to be a very worthy cause. Remember, this isn't just about having a nice place to picnic. It's about being cut off from the natural environment that promotes optimal health and fitness. Education is also key. As we encourage more movement and try to support the basic needs of the population, we should also be explaining the importance of regular movement. Kids learn a bit about anatomy and PE. But I wish I'd learned the importance of the hip hinge, or how to retract my scapula. We need to stop idolising aesthetic physiques and focus instead on performant ones. And imagine if we had regular fitness checkups, just as some countries encourage regular health checkups to try and screen for early signs of disease. The same approach could be taken to fitness. This might include cardio tests, mobility challenges, and checks to look for compensatory movement patterns and other signs of dysfunction. But the obvious irony is that a fitter and healthier population would also be more productive. But that's not the point. I mean, why are we so obsessed with growth and productivity in the first place? These changes may be decades away. They may never come. So what can we do in the meantime? While we can't change our environments, what we can do is to change our relationship to the environment. Stairs offer an opportunity to jump. A walk to the shops can just as easily be a run to the shops. We can educate ourselves about movement and we can share our successes with others. We can lift each other up. That's one of the things I try and do on this channel. And as we do, we should stop comparing ourselves to each other. We should quit the rat race. And no, when I say quit the rat race, I don't mean start a dropshipping business. That's just going more into the rat race. I mean detaching ourselves from the outcomes, changing our goals. I recently had the option to grow this channel, to take on staff and maybe get a bigger office. I have invitations to do interviews on big podcasts in other parts of the world, for which I'm very grateful and honoured. This would undoubtedly raise my profile and bring in more cash. But I spent some time, reflected and thought, and you know what? I don't want to get bigger. Sure, I'd like to reach a million subscribers, that would be a personal achievement, but I'm earning enough money to support my family, and I love what I'm doing. Every time I have an interview, it stresses me the heck out. Every new opportunity just means I'm rushing more and spending less time with my family. 
actually means I'm training less, which is kind of the point. I have less time to exercise when I have more work to do. So why not just sit back and enjoy it? Enjoy this extremely privileged position I'm in to get paid to make content about fitness and superheroes, to work in an office that has a pull-up bar in it. If I wasn't in this extremely fortunate position, I would be working hard to earn enough to comfortably look after my family, but then I'd stop. Why would a manager on a high salary ever want a promotion? I've never understood the CEOs that stay on long after they've earned enough money to retire to a paradise island, long after the job role is completely warped from the thing they were presumably passionate about to begin with, when they start acquiring businesses in different industries and crushing the individuality out of them. And this same mentality can be applied to other aspects of life too. When we stop competing with the world and focus on happiness, we become infinitely freer. If you're struggling to get by, you probably won't have the free time or the resources to maintain your optimal fitness. But once you do, maybe it's time to stop pushing for more and to focus on actually doing that. We're taught that this obsession with work, with progress, with business is the grown up thing to do. It's noble and stuff. Keep your billion dollar paycheck if it means sitting in meetings all day. So I hope you found this video interesting guys. It potentially got a little bit political at points, but I tried not to get too controversial. I might have gotten a bit carried away though because I was listening to cool violin music whilst I was writing. The dangers of cool violin music. I guess what I wanted to say here is that fitness doesn't entirely come down to individual responsibility. We should be sympathetic to those who find it difficult to find the time or resources to train. To ignore the impact of socio-economic pressures is naive. To help solidify these ideas, I'm suggesting the term motion punk or movement punk. Like solar punk or cyberpunk before it, motion punk can be a genre, an aesthetic, a philosophy, or a subculture. It envisions a world where natural human movement is the priority and where architecture, politics, cultural norms, and fashion all exist in service of that. In this world, cities are designed with built-in movement options that would be inherently fun and engaging, like giant playgrounds or levels of a computer game. I used Mid Journey to visualize what this might look like. This to stimulate the body and mind through regular commutes. Nature would be an integral part of this design and would blend seamlessly into the design alongside vertical scaffolding, slides, swings, and climbing walls. Other travel options include human-powered machines. We have bikes, but how about pararizers? What else could we envision? Technology in general would aim to augment and not replace our natural features. Think maximumism, not transhumanism, where technology trains us in exciting new ways rather than replacing body parts or changing us entirely. People wear clothing that values function over form, loose fitting trousers and minimal shoes. Activities like dance, martial arts, parkour, gymnastics and climbing are celebrated. It's normal to see people running and jumping in the streets. Governments exist to support freedom of movement, to take care of our fundamental needs so that we would be free to express ourselves and to explore. There is a spirit of fun and of playful rebellion against the boring, static and self-serious. It's just an idea, but it's a vision of a world where society supports rather than challenges fitness. Maybe it can stimulate some discussion. This is my blueprint for a fitter humanity. What's yours? Let me know down below, and it should be an interesting comment section. Thanks again for watching guys, and bye for now.